Who doesn't love a shameless sequel? Yes, one of my videos, Extinct Animals of Ancient History, has done very well for itself, and if I were to guess, might have been how you first found my channel. Coincidentally enough, I've decided that maybe there was more to the subject of the first video than I covered. Of course, to any who have never seen that first one, I would definitely advise you to watch it before watching this video. To those who have seen the first one, well, there are some things I want to correct in the original video. Because, of course, my most popular video as of now also has to be the one that I riddled with errors. For instance, this, India and parts of southwestern Europe, is very clearly southeastern Europe. This animal is called not an auroch, but an aurox, plural auroxen, just like ox and oxen. And I have no idea why there's a time-traveling little kid in this image I used of the ancient world. And yeah, that's all of the errors. Oh, maybe you thought that this was an error. 480 BCE, starting in the 10th century AD. It is reasonable to assume a man who mixed up these terms is just being accidentally moronic, but really it was a calculated effort on my part to compromise with those who prefer BC and AD and others who prefer BCE and CE. Totally not the dumbest mistake on this channel. Maybe not a mistake, but a flaw I saw pointed out in the original video is how domestic the extinct types of animals I chose to talk about were, most just variations of still living creatures. Of course, I did this not to be intentionally boring, but to stay within the very narrow parameters of an animal seen and documented by the ancient old world. But for this video, it's no holds barred. Any animal, as long as it's neat enough to talk about in this video, and was observed by a historic people group, can get on this list. So let's dive in. To the Bering Sea, that is, to find what is truly a chunky marine mammal. Is it a whale? No. A seal? Nope. A sea cow? A very strange guess. But yes, actually. The stellar sea cow looks really nothing like a cow, more like a cross between porpoise and walrus. The cow aspect comes out with its diet. It is hypothesized to have been an obligate herbivore, and fed not on meadows of grass, but kelp forests. Off the kelp they grew humongous, 10 meters long and up to 10 metric tons, with a thick layer of blubber to protect them from the frigid water. They were discovered by Europeans via a Russian expeditionary team in 1741, who were shipwrecked at the animal's sole habitat, the Commander Islands between Alaska and Russia. Here they were described by German biologist Georg Steller. Along with describing all of the basics I just outlined to you, Steller also noted the animal's meat was positively yummy, which should be the ultimate sign for any remote animal population that it's game over. Large docile animal plus invaders plus good grilling potential equals way of the dodo. In a few decades, the sea cow was erased from the earth. But the sea cow story actually goes deeper than that. I mean, how did these marine animals become confined to the shores of just a few tiny islands? In reality, the sea cow's decline probably starts much, much earlier than it seems. Sea cows, by the way, aren't related to cows, or whales, or walruses, but rather sirenians, with its closest living relative being the dugong. Sirenians are, of course, tropical animals. So how did the sea cow get stuck in the Bering Sea? Thousands of years ago, during the last ice age, the receding ocean level opened up more coastal habitat for sirenians like the sea cow, and they thrived all around the northern coast of the Pacific, from Japan to California. But as the ice caps melted, sea cows suffered from habitat loss, becoming essentially stranded from other populations of their species as shallow sea was replaced with deeper oceans they were unfamiliar with crossing. The Commander Islands, where they were found in modern times, were particularly isolated from outside populations of sea cows, even during the shallower times of the Ice Age. You know who the Commander Islands were also isolated from? Aboriginal humans, whose arrival in other areas of the Pacific coastline coincidentally line up with the local extinction of sea cows. As well, their extinction might not have all been due to overhunting. What may be partially responsible was the overhunting of another lovable marine mammal, the sea otter. Humans who hunted otters for their fur would have indirectly increased the multitudes of the otter's natural prey, the sea urchin, which in turn indirectly hurts the kelp forest that urchins feed on, and ends up drastically decreasing the grazing sea cow, 
which would have needed plenty of kelp in order to survive. The very last sea cows of the Commander Islands were safe from the human contact, but their small isolated population over the years unfortunately made them inbred and genetically unfit. The adult specimens Stellar discovered were described as significantly smaller than their 10-ton prehistoric ancestors. All this to say that the sea cow might have been on the decline regardless if the Russians had discovered them. Whether it be overhunting or the cascade effect of otters, or even their low genetic diversity, the Stellar sea cow was not long for our changing world. It is hard to top the sea cow in terms of awe-inspiring historic animals, but I've tried, so I present to you a wolf. Wait, wait, wait. Before your brain shuts off, this is not any ordinary boring wolf, trust me. It comes from one of the most alien, upside-down places in the known universe. Of course, by that I mean Japan. The Japanese wolf, also known as the Honshu wolf, named after the main island of Japan, distinguishes itself from the usual gray wolf in a variety of ways. Genetically, it was just not similar to anything else at the time of its extinction. Japanese wolf are thought to be related closest to the extinct Pleistocene wolf population. I went over those wolves in my last video, but essentially they were animals built for hunting the shaggy giants of the Ice Age, equipped with strong, short jaws. Presumably, the last of these Pleistocene wolves made their way to the island of Honshu before rising sea levels cut them off from all other competing wolf populations leaving them the sole subspecies of the Japanese island. They still physically differed from normal wolves, being one of the smallest subspecies of Canis lupus. But the other big difference between them and mainland wolves was cultural. I don't mean like Japanese wolf culture, but the perception the Japanese people held to the wolves. In various other places, wolves were historically portrayed as malicious animals that killed valuable livestock and were better dead than alive. This evil identity of the wolf in the West has given us some truly incredible quotes. But on Honshu, the reputation of the wolf was one of a beneficial animal. The wolf was integral in helping cut down the numbers of boar and deer, who were the primary pests of Japanese farms. This relationship with rural villages was seen as benign and even symbiotic. Because of this, instead of being demonized, wolves were worshipped as helpful mountain spirits by villagers. Shrines were built for their worship, and in some cases the skulls were charms of prayer, and offerings of food were given to wolves when a pup was born. It wasn't all good times, of course. On occasion, wolves were hunted and exterminated for the safety of livestock, but even in this circumstance, it was understood the wolf killer was liable for spiritual revenge. Indeed, for a long time, the Honshu wolf lived a harmonious life with the rural Japanese villages that lived adjacent to its mountainous domain. But this would change with a particularly nasty immigrant to the Japanese islands, and this time I'm not talking about Europeans. In the late 17th century, rabies made its way to Japan, and with it began infecting the native population of wolf. Before this, wolf attacks were very uncommon with a now berserk section of the Honshu wolves going out and endangering human livelihoods, the population had to be culled. As well, mass construction of wooden castles and buildings that started in the 16th century increased deforestation of Honshu. Although this would not hurt wolves directly, it would hurt the numbers of forest animals the wolves preyed on, which in turn sent them to go hunting for livestock and into more conflict with humans. Over the centuries, the Honshu wolf's benign relationship with humans faded along with its population, dwindling more and more until the death of the last recorded Japanese wolf in 1905. Still, rumors of the wolf's continued survival persist among the rural folk of Japan. Like all rumors, most of it is presumably untrue, but the insistence of villagers that the wolf secretly survive might say more about the wolf's cultural impact than anything. The wolf seems to be a symbol of something bigger than itself, of the fading memory of a pre-modern Japan whose relations with her natural splendor have disappeared with industrialization. All that remains now of the wolf, the mighty upland spirit of Japan, is just that, the spirit of a protective beast that once was. Let me interrupt this guy to ask you a question. Do you like this? Hopefully, if you've gotten this far, the answer is yes, you like my content, despite how uncommonly I post nowadays. 
Well, do you like it enough to possibly want more? If the answer to that is yes, I would like to direct you to a fantastic project I am a part of, a brand new YouTube channel called Life and the Earth. This channel will be dedicated to the fantastic natural history of our planet, across multiple times and places to tell the amazing story of life. Not only will the videos on this channel come out more regularly, but they will be the length of a short documentary with video production that rivals anything else on the paleontology side of YouTube. This channel isn't just me, by the way, which should have been clear by the production quality. I'm only the head writer and researcher, and I'm surrounded by an amazing team of artists and editors working together to make some amazing content. So please, if you like the topics tackled on this channel and the writing that propels it into your brain, I would highly recommend checking out Life and the Earth. Now we go to another island predator, but this one much more recognized as an extinct specimen lost to time. The Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylacine, was probably the most requested animal for me to talk about in a second part of the original video, and for good reason. There isn't much like it. Like most of the indigenous Australian mammals, the thylacine was a marsupial, and although the size of a large dog, it was still significantly larger than any other carnivorous marsupial of the modern era. It shares almost nothing in common with a tiger besides the stripes. In fact, it hunted nothing like other large predators, be it wolves, big cats, or even hyenas. The ratio of a predator's femur and metatarsal have a negative relation to its running speed, and the thylacine has a ratio much higher than any other large pursuit predator, more comparable to something like a badger, not exactly an Olympic sprinter. As well, its snout is incredibly long for a large predator, more comparable to foxes than wolves. This suggests a weaker bite force at the canines and therefore a reliance on hunting smaller prey. But unlike the jaw, the canines were incredibly strong and seemed to fracture very rarely. All in all, the thylacine was a predator who preferred open fields to do its hunting. It wasn't exactly a pursuit predator nor an ambush one, but something in the middle, and fed on prey smaller than itself. It would deliver a crushing, piercing bite with a snap of its jaws that subdued whatever unfortunate macropod it was hunting. The thylacine was originally distributed throughout mainland Australia, although sometime before European colonization, it disappeared, with speculation that this was caused by the emergence of the dingo. Whatever the reason was, it became sequestered to the southern island of Tasmania. The Tasmanian tiger numbers remained stable until the colonization of the island by who else but the British, who unleashed several factors that threatened thylacine numbers. A bounty was put on the animal due to its reputation as a livestock hunter, which it probably wasn't even that proficient of. Many thylacines were killed this way, but many more were also displaced by habitat loss to ranchers, and the introduction of feral dogs to the island providing stiff competition. All these factors combined for an animal that would become extinct. The last wild thylacine was shot in 1930, with plenty of rumors about the animal living on deep in the Tasmanian wilderness. But the last recorded specimen of a Tasmanian tiger was kept in captivity at the Hobart Zoo. This individual is what scientists call an endling, the last of a species. This particular endling was finally laid to rest on September 7, 1936. What is maybe most appealing about the thylacine is that its appearance is not confined to fossils cave paintings, or illustrations, but film, as you've probably noticed. Although it's a tearjerker that it ever perished, the fact that there is a moving, breathing thylacine in this recording is what makes historically extinct animals sad but fascinating. Some were able to stick around for us, and even for our technology, but not long enough to be saved. Even sadder is some of these documentations show what is presumably a species endling, the last of a species, a truly lonely existence brought about by human interference with nature. I think another great example of this, of seeing into the past to watch these extinct species, is this famous photo of a Barbary lion. Barbary lions were a variant of lions found in North Africa, who went extinct early in the 20th century. And supposedly, this photograph depicts the last of these wild animals, 
walking into the unknown. There's a lot of scrutiny around this picture. I've been told that the lion resembles a toy, and the whole thing might be a hoax, which is unfortunate, but what I feel is reality. But this next example is without doubt real. The Kauai O'o was a small bird native to the Hawaiian island of Kauai, which fed on fruits, bugs, and most notably the nectar of flowering trees. Its numbers were decimated due to the introduction of new diseases, predators, and the ever-threatening habitat loss brought to the Hawaiian Islands by settlers. It was last seen in 1985, but last heard in 87. This song you are hearing is presumably the harmony of the species and length. It is the mating call of a male, calling out to a companion that would never answer. 